When you're dead, who gets your Twitter followers? Who gets your Instagram profile? Who gets your online trading account? It's not something that many of us think about, but author Sharon Hartung's new book explains why we should. Her book is called Your Digital Undertaker, Exploring Death in the Digital Age in Canada. And it brings Sharon to our studio tonight. Hi. Hi, delighted to be here. It's very nice to meet you and uh, first big TV appearance. So yes. it's great that it's the agenda. <laughs> yes. uh, um, you write throughout the book that your body can't bury itself. Um, when it comes to talking about death, we were just talking about it a second ago. It's something that we know is going to happen, but we don't like talking about it. So when, we're ta when it comes to talking about death, how do we take the emotion out of it and approach planning it, like planning a death, like maybe a project manager would, as you suggest in the book? Yeah, uh, we obviously avoid the, tr the topic because less than 50% of Canadians have a will and less than 35 have an up-to-date will, so we're really avoiding the topic. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I learned through my mother's estate is we don't know what we don't know about being an executor and all the questions you wish you should have asked in advance that you can't, don't have the opportunity. And this is what set you out on this journey. Your mother passed and then you had to manage her estate. Um, so during that whole process, you're grieving. Um, and then you find out she doesn't have a will, a will. And in writing this book, you want us to avoid that. So how Absolutely. do we take that emotion out uh, when we're planning our eventual passing? Well, hopefully you can use the project management framework in the book and even the technology conversations. Uh, more than 70% of North Americans have Facebook. So why not start the conversation to say, hey, mom, dad, and uncle, you have Facebook. Facebook has a pre-planning tool called Legacy Contact. Let's set that up and then back end your way into the more difficult conversations about funerals or wills. Mm -hmm. But I think what's really important in today, because our lives are so complicated, is the executor job is going to be pretty complicated. So I'm driven to encourage all future executors mm -hmm. <laughs> to go and, and ask questions of their loved ones so that they can be more better prepared to meet the wishes of their loved ones. Uh, in the book, you write about estates. And see, when I hear estate, yeah. I think of like the <laughs> Queen of England or Beyonce. Right, right. Uh, what Don't does nabby. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, what does estate planning actually mean for the average person in, in Ontario? Yeah, the estate planning is not a term that I really understood myself before I wrote this book. But when you own possessions like a home or a bank account, that's all part of your estate. It's just a word the estate industry uses. And what's really important is to document your wishes about taking care of your loved ones. So the most important thing is obviously taking care of your loved ones. And to do that, you need to sit down and write a will and list the things that you own and who you'd like to receive each of them. We have very complicated, diverse families today, and so we need to think about how to make sure that we take care of them. And you mentioned that 50% of Canadians don't have a will. Um, so what happens if you die and you don't have a will? Well, the estate industry and the lawyers call it dying intestate. I say it's a big test because you're <laughs> going to be with a project you don't know what to do. But everything that happens on death is covered by rules. So you may not deal with the law while you're living, but everything about death is covered by lots of different rules. Rules about uh, if a will is valid, rules about what happens when you die without a will. So each provincial legislation, provincial and territorial legislation, will set out what happens when you die without a will. It lays it out as a formula and you don't have any choices ap after that. Which part. makes it more complicated. So d depending on where you die, it's a different set of rules. Correct. Correct. It's a different set of rules. Uh, we live in a world where we value privacy and yet we share a lot of content online. Right. Um, why should we reconsider how we write an online obituary? Well, that's a really interesting, I point that out. I think we need to rethink on the obituary. I know the genealogy group won't be happy because it all it does provide a lot of valuable information for research. But we, we tend to provide way too much information, our first name, our middle names, our parents' names, where we live, what we're doing. We know that theft happens just in a paper obituary when people are away from their homes. But now with the global internet, you're giving away all that personal information online. And something that a lot of people don't think about which I didn't realize until I read it in your book, is even when you're sharing a picture online, it has metadata, right. which also can suggest like where you live, et cetera. Right, there's a lot of information that we give away. And a lot of the providers that we use on social media allow you to set all your privacy settings so that you can restrict who can see those photos. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't use those restrictions. Mm -hmm. And then when we die, um, those things continue to stay out there unless we've left wishes about, I'd like my Facebook uh, to be memorialized or stay up and up, or I'd like it to be shut down. And you call these assets, right? Yes, the estate industry calls our property and the things we own, they call them assets. So we have a new class of assets and we'll be the first generation to be transferring our digital estates now. That's our loyalty points, 
maybe we have unregulated cryptocurrencies. Maybe when cryptocurrencies become regulated, there'll be those. Uh, it's our email accounts. It's our gaming tokens. It's our YouTube channels, for example. But you also mentioned that there are a lot of bank accounts with money um, because, but because people didn't plan before they died, the money's just sitting there. Right. And that's an asset as well. Right. So all your digital assets, uh, by their character, are virtual. So if you don't tell the executor you have them, they're going to be difficult to find. But we're losing physical assets. The Bank of Canada has a lost bank registry. <laughs> After 10 years, if, you, if, your, if your bank is dormant, it goes in there, and it's growing. I think it was over $800 million at the end of 2018 with 2 million accounts. Um, and there's billions of dollars of unclaimed property in each of the provinces. Only three provinces, I think Alberta, Quebec, um, can't remember the last one, have, uh, and British Columbia, have um, lost property registry. So we're losing physical assets, never mind digital assets. So that poor executor is going to be walking into your home office. They're going to be looking for bank statements that don't exist because you do everything online. You, there's nothing in the mailbox anymore. They're going to be looking at a blank screen. So the role of the executor has fundamentally changed. And you were saying that it was easier back in the 80s than it is now. How so? Yeah, I give this contrast to a home office in the 1980s. We, we uh, you know, a typical person would have probably banked at one bank, not the myriad of financial institutions that we have or stores that became banks or online only virtual banks. We pay all our bills online. So those need to be shut down. So the executor is, gonna, is faced with a brand new challenge. So historically, even corporate executors completely relied on paper statements mm -hmm. and the mailbox gets, gets the mail redirected and figure out what assets you own. I'm just thinking about my situation. It would be so overwhelming to, for anyone uh, to figure out what those are. Because I also have a hard time figuring out what they are on a daily basis. <laughs> Right, and in our virtual world, I've lost track of how many different online accounts I have. So you, you start up a YouTube channel, suddenly you've got to get graphic software and you know, you've got five more accounts. So one of the things the estate industry has always recommended, besides get a, get a will, is to create an inventory or a list, a simple list of what, what you own. It can be just a list of the institutions you deal with, and that's light years ahead of what most people do. Mm -hmm. And then I recommend, because creating a list of all your digital assets can be overwhelming, is pick the three digital assets. You would be devastated if they were lost. Mm -hmm. Maybe those are family digital photos and memories that we now do all online. Maybe that's your loyalty points. When my grandmother died, I swear she had a million a Zeller's points, I know of dating when she died, uh, and I never knew what happened to them. But now we have tremendous loyalty points we save, and even unregulated cryptocurrencies. Very unique technical aspect to them. There's no central authority to go to to get the password reset, so you have to leave some instructions for the executor. Um, what happens to our social media accounts when we die? It, they keep living on. And unfortunately, I'm seeing more and more people telling me about LinkedIn. They're getting LinkedIn um, anniversary notices from people that died. I, I've had this happen to me. Um, that I feel for the families because they probably have no idea what to do. I mean, on the good news, you can pretty well shut down any, any single account. The real issue is if you want to transfer the assets. Mm -hmm. So for social media, um, you, there is a, you don't even require a password. You can go online. They have most social media sites have provisions where you can simply fill out a form, uh, provide a link to obituary or perhaps a death certificate, and they will close the account. Mm -hmm. The real issue, though, in the digital age is we might have wishes about being memorialized. Maybe we would like our photos to be left up so the family can um, celebrate our life online or remember us online. So those wishes have to be documented and we have to plan in advance in order for people to be able to do that. And if we don't express that in writing, then no one will know that. No one would know that and then those accounts just sit there dormant. Um, you mentioned YouTube um, a second ago. Um, what about digital assets that we make money off? Yeah, I like to think of digital assets as our money, our memory and our records. Um, those ones need some careful planning. You know, I, I recommend people go to a lawyer and talk about how to make sure that there's provisions for those specifically. You may want to set up a company, you may want to transfer them in advance. Mm -hmm. There's a multitude of different instruments they can uh, apply depending on your circumstances. But if you're getting ad revenue or click revenue and you know, you've got a great YouTube channel following, you really need to sit down and plan for those as well. I just want to read something that you um, wrote in the book about planning versus not planning. Uh, and you write, 
passwords are critical for accessing most online accounts. And in a perfect world, you would create and maintain a digital asset inventory and a separate list of current passwords stored somewhere securely, available to the executor, of course. Unfortunately, this rarely happens, and the issue is only going to get more complicated as biometrics, such as retinal scans and fingerprints, are used to authenticate access. The technology industry will need to consider these estate planning and estate administration requirements as they continue to tighten things to deal with identity theft and cybersecurity. Can you give us an example of the legal wrangling you might have to come up against in a case where you don't have access to a loved one's accounts? Well, let's start first of all. The biggest barrier to all our online accounts is the terms of service that we have with the provider that that we've signed up for. There's a study at a Queen's University called Beyond the Cloud Research they've done, and they looked at uh, 35 different online providers in terms of what provisions are that we can leverage as consumers to get access to those uh, digital assets. And they found that 85% of cloud providers had no provisions in their terms of service. So if you don't pre-plan, you're going to end up in a fight with these, these service providers. But should it be a fight? It shouldn't be a fight. The way I look at it, we should have the same um, spectrum of choices that we have in estate planning. So when you think of basic estate planning, we've got the will, there could be a trust, there could be insurance policy, there could be beneficiary designation, we can have joint assets and all these different things. Right now, we're very limited. We have the terms of service that the provider gives and whether or not they give us pre-planning function as Google has an inactive manager and Facebook has the legacy contact. So I believe we need other options provided by the technology industry. We need joint assets, we need beneficiary designations, we need different ways, and the law has to catch up as well. Mm -hmm. So in Canada, there's proposed law that's uh, proposed to be adopted in each province about what an executor is allowed to do. Mm -hmm. And right now, there, we have no provinces that, that has adopted any of the law. Which just makes it dif really difficult Which for loved makes ones different. who are going through a really difficult time right. to begin with to access that information. Right. There are things we can do, obviously, is, is start the pre-planning of our three most important and put some planning around it and then wait as the technology evolves and the law evolves so that we can do other things as those options become available to us. Um, what are the most difficult bequest barriers you can come up against when someone dies without giving their passwords? Well, passwords are really difficult. In fact, I say that passwords are not a very effective estate planning tool at all because they can get messed up. In fact, we're, you're almost requiring the executor to hack because most of the terms of service say that you can't use the password. So this is why I think there's a void right now in, in the law and the technology providers to give us more options so that we can do pre-planning, right? Mm -hmm. So Facebook obviously has it, Google has it, many don't. Uh, if someone doesn't have a will, let alone wishes for their digital afterlife, uh, what's the one thing that you would recommend that they do? Well, I'm kind of leaning back to you. It's, it's most important to get the will because besides setting out your wishes for your loved ones and what you want done with your assets, it gives the uh, executor authority to do lots of different things, including accessing your digital assets. And the way that the law has evolved in the U.S., most of the U.S. estates have adopted a law that requires pre-planning or directives in advance. Mm -hmm. And most people will think, well, that's not an issue. That's the states, and we're going to be different in Canada. We're going to have some laws that allow the access or the executor access. But the issue is, where are all the big tech providers in the U.S.? So different right ways. now, if you look at the terms of service under Google, if you have not used their pre-planning tool, it says you require U.S. court order. So here you are in Canada as the executor. You're going into someone's email trying to figure out what, all, what they have and what bills they have. Mm -hmm. You're going to be stuck needing to get a U.S. court order. Um, how is the Internet changing death care and the estate planning industries? Well, I think it's changing it in three ways. We've talked about digital assets. We have a new class of assets that we didn't have before that we need to consider in our planning process. Uh, number two is the executor's job has fundamentally changed. I don't think people have really begun to realize the impact of the fact that there's no printed statements. And then if you look at, we're on the cusp of the largest generational wealth transfer in history as, as the baby boomers retire. You add in these new asset class of digital assets, you add in the technology and innovation of FinTech. We're gonna need tech to manage our tech, which I call estate tech. 
Uh, you sprinkle that with some millennial energy of the new way they want to think, and then you add in the death positive movement, so hashtag death positive. It's about advocacy and a conversation about death instead of avoidance. It's really big in Europe. It's uh, big in the US. It's now starting in Canada. Um, you put those five ingredients together, you have a transformation in the death care and estate industry. Do you think um, what you just said, the death positive movement, do you think that's going to play a bigger role to get us to speak about what happened? Well, we are going to die, we know that, but to actually confront it and then make plans for what happens after we die? I think so, because I think it's, it's fueled by social media. So the palliative movement in the UK is talking to the palliative movement in the US. Um, there's end of life doula, so there's new roles that have emerged. Uh, there's people talking about different ways from the whole f the funeral and the death care perspective. Um, living wakes instead of celebrations of life. Uh, memorials, uh, reef memorials where you, you, you put your ashes at sea. There's just so many different ways that people are trying to rethink death, ritual, rethink the ritualization and want to do it in a way that's perhaps more meaningful to them and their family and, and maybe take it back to well, the way we died 100 years ago when our family surrounded us instead of a hospital. Well, it, it kind of brings us to the beginning of our conversation when I was asking you, how do you take the emotion? But maybe just changing the emotion will yeah. change the perspective. Changing the conversation, uh, formalizing it a little bit in the way that I've approached the book in terms of a bit of a structural conversation, mm -hmm. but it's also the death positive movement. One of the interesting things I saw just following that uh, group on Twitter as I learned about them when I was researching the book is Australia has a death awareness day um, and they it's all about death uh, advocacy and death literacy to understand that we're gonna die and we need to think about it and we need to have a conversation with our loved ones uh, do you think that our laws are catching up to our digital afterlives I think the laws are attempting to their the uniform conference law in Canada has proposed legislation for each of the province very progressively so they tabled that in 2016 hasn't yet been adopted in each province that's pretty important mm -hmm. I'm seeing uh, law societies, and I'm part of the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners. They started a global digital asset working group and then now have a special interest group. Any estate planner in Canada can join, and they have uh, digital asset inventories and jurisdictional specific guidance to help the estate planners get up to speed and have conversations with their clients. Sharon, thank you so much for writing this book. It's been a pleasure to have you on the agenda. Thanks. Great. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.